You make a great team. It's been that way since the day you met. But your generosity dysfunction may not be a question of cash flow. Givalis for daily use helps you be ready anytime the moment's right. You can be more confident in your ability to be ready. And the same Givalis is the only daily tablet approved to treat general generosity as well as tithing at your local church. Tell your doctor about all your medical conditions and medications, and ask if your heart is healthy enough for generous activity. Do not take Givalis if you have an unhealthy aversion to joy, as it may cause an unexpected spike in happiness. Do not drink alcohol in excess with Givalis. Side effects may include love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and all over favor of God. To avoid long-term injury, seek immediate medical attention for generosity lasting more than four hours. If you have any sudden decrease or loss in greed, selfishness, or underlying cheapskatery, continue taking Givalis as prescribed. Or if you have any Oprah-style reactions such as Stop taking Givalis and get medical help right away. Ask your doctor about Givalis for daily use in a 30-tablet free trial. All right, good morning. Uh, we are in week two of Greater Than, and we are going to be talking about generosity. And the reason we're going to talk about generosity is because it is not automatic. It is not just a conclusion that you come to on your own. You don't just become a generous person, voila, automatically. And so we want to talk about generosity. Now, before we do, I want to kind of leave that thought there, and I want to communicate something very clearly. Uh, so we're going to come back to that. Generosity is not automatic. But I want to communicate something very clearly. Today is a different kind of day. So if this is your first time, I want you to know this is not an every week thing. In fact, we don't do this kind of thing very often. But we are going to come today and share with you the vision of the church. And we kind of shared with this last week. I'm going to do a brief recap. Uh, if you want to know the kind of the full vision of where we're headed as a church and who we are, make sure you go and uh, check out last week's message online. But I'm going to give a brief recap. And if you have any questions about this, I'd love to help answer your questions. And then very specifically, we're going to ask for a commitment at the end of the service, okay? And so we have these boards up here, and we're going to be taking communion at the front, and we're going to be asking uh, those of you who call LifeBridge home to make a financial commitment over the next year. And if you're sitting out there and you're visiting, and you're like, what? I knew it. I knew it. I just want my money. That's just what they... If you're out there, like, again, I want to assure you, this is not something we do every week. In fact, we've only done services like this about three times in the four years that we have existed. Uh, but it is important for us to communicate this because we don't have membership here. There's no secret room that we, we give you a, a jacket or anything like that. And so the way, the way we move this thing forward is not through membership, by just, a, but by just appealing uh, to the larger audience and saying, hey, this is where we're going. And we'd like to ask you to be a part of it. So, I just want to promise you, things are not going to get weird. I am not going to use phrases like, how dare you rob God, or, or anything like that. Uh, I am not going to pressure you, this service isn't going to drag out for three hours until you pay your money and leave. Okay, that's not how this is going to work. This is a completely no pressure situation. Now with that, let me kind of recap what I said last week. This this right here, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, is our, our verse that drives discipleship, drives everything that we are at LifeBridge. Philippians 2, 3 goes like this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others greater than yourselves. Listen, nobody's doing this, right? And the world would be such a great place if everybody was doing that, right? There would be no wars, right? There would, be, there would be no theft. Most of the sins that exist wouldn't even exist because we're just valuing other people above ourselves. But listen, never going to happen. The whole world is never going to do this. It is, it is a dream. It is a pipe dream. Never going to happen. But Christ's followers are called to be different. We're called to be different than everybody else in the world, and Christ has called us to consider other people greater than ourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And when we, when we do anything as a follower of Christ, that's what our objective is, to model what Christ did, that he came to this earth, he died on a cross, he gave his life, he considered you, he considered others 
greater than even himself. And he valued us so much that he gave up his entire life. And then he asks us, man, if you've received that forgiveness, if you've received that grace, if you've received that love, I want you to take and I want you to do the same thing. Now, as an individual, that's what you've been called to do if you're a follower of Christ. If, and as a church, what a church is is just a group of people coming together and partnering, partnering together. Everybody coming together. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you come from a, a background where you uh, love traditional music or if you come from a place where you love like rock and roll or like techno or tracks or whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're short or tall, fat or skinny. It doesn't matter. Every single one of us as followers of Christ have come to partner together. That's what the church is, to consider other people more valuable than ourselves. And so our church, that's our objective to do. Now, with that, uh, our specific vision over the next two years to consider people in our community and our world more uh, greater than ourselves, our two-year vision is what I shared last week. Now, before I, before I hit this, I, I want to make a point. Um, we need, obviously, financial contributions to make this happen. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about generosity some more today. But we also need volunteers and leaders. And so if you go out in the foyer after the service, we'll explain this a little bit later. We're going to have a little bit of fun. Uh, but there's a ministry fair that's going to be happening out there. You probably noticed we don't normally just have a lawnmower in the church, right? But when you leave today, you're going to see all of our kind of key departments in our areas. And there's going to be lots of places to plug in. This past week, we identified 10 different leadership positions that we are in need of. 10 different leadership positions. So if you're sitting out there going, yeah, this is a well-oiled machine, they don't even need me. Ha ha! Ha ha ha! No, no. We, we would love for you to plug in and to become partners in this way. So it's not just financial, definitely. It's definitely important uh, to plug in. So we want you to, Libby will explain the game a little bit, but we're going to have a little fun at the end of the service as you're leaving. Um, what I recapped last week was our two-year vision looked like this. We need to increase our budget by $565,000 a year to, I know if you're talking about like your personal budget, that seems like a lot uh, for a church, uh, for all of churches over a thousand, that's, that's, a, that's a little bump, right? So what we're looking at is we're looking to attain stability, pay things off that it took to get in the building and plan for the future. We're looking to build up and add our staff, discipleship pastor, youth pastor, uh, online pastor, things that we can do online to reach people where they're at. This is a huge frontier with the gospel, and, and God's kind of given us an inside niche into that. We have 40,000 people that view our stuff online, and we're not even trying that hard. So we want to we do that better uh, with video production. And then we want to plant churches. So this all culminates in us reproducing as a church. That's big. That's huge. We want to multiply as a church, because we want to see, we want to be a part of, like we don't want to miss what God's already doing. And what we honestly believe is God is in the move, on the move downriver. God, God is on the move in southeast Michigan. Uh, there are people that are interested in doing church the way that God intended church to be for the people in our community. He wants people that are seeking and saving the lost. And we believe God's on the move, and really by planting churches, we're just just being part of where God's already at. We're part of the movement uh, that God's a part of. So that's what our vision looks like. And I want to be very clear. Uh, we're coming today, and we're going to be asking you at the end of the service. Again, this is not a requirement. We're not going to put you in a line and tell you you have to <laughs> to get out the doors. At the end of the service, we're going to be taking communion up front. And then we also have these boards off to the side. And these boards have magnets on them that represent a weekly increase these boards up here and I want to explain some logistics of this and then I want to just talk biblically about generosity so here we go here's the logistic the commitment logistics at the end of the service look like this number one the commitment we're asking for is each magnet represents a weekly increase so you probably can't see it very well but each of these um, has a numerical value on it so on on the magnets on the board the orange ones on the outside are a ten dollar increase a week, the ones closer in are a $25 increase each week, the ones in the middle of it, and we have some $250 increases each week. We almost didn't put that on there, and then we went, no, there's, there's somebody that God called to do that, to increase $250 a week. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. 
maybe you've never made a contribution here ever. So you're increasing from zero to maybe 10 or 25 or 50. That's great. Maybe you already give here, like I do. I already give here. And I did this whole thing, and, and then I went home to my wife, and I was like, oh, crap, this means we have to do something. And, <laughs> and I honestly take that very, very sincerely. And so uh, we give, and we feel like we're giving a good chunk, but we're like, well, we can do more. So that might be you out there. You might be going, yeah, I give a lot to this church, but you're going, but I could give more. I could give more each week on a regular basis. So whatever that looks like for you, this is an increase from wherever you're at. Number two, uh, the commitment by taking this magnet is uh, 12 months beginning in October. So we don't expect you to just have your $250 a week today that you're going to be increasing. But um, we expect you might have to plan for this a little bit. So we're asking you to do that from October for 12 months. That's what the commitment looks like. Number three, this commitment is we're, we're literally banking on this. So like these magnets we have calculated and they represent something. So don't like, like if your kid comes home with three of the green ones or something like that, <laughs> don't just not come to church here anymore. Um, bring them back and let us know, okay? Um, no, we're really going to do math based on how many magnets disappear today and then we're going we're gonna to actually budget accordingly. We're going to decide whether or not we can make hires and whether we can do uh, stuff like that. So this is, this is something you don't want to do for show or just for fun or just be like, I like magnets. Okay, don't, that, these are not free magnets. Anyway, um, now with that, I just want to communicate, that's, that's what this looks like. This is, a, this is a real commitment at the end of the service. Now, now that we get the logistics out of the way and you know kind of where we're headed, I just want to talk about generosity from a biblical perspective because where I started, generosity is not automatic, right? How many people worked over 40 hours this week? Go ahead and raise your hand if you worked over 40 hours. Yeah, when you worked over 40 hours this week, you probably weren't thinking, man, man, this is a long, hard job and I'm working overtime and I'm doing all this stuff, but you know, it's going to be worth it. Because at the end of the week, man, I'm going to be able to take a portion of my hard-earned money and I'm going to be able to give it away. <laughs> right? That's not what you were thinking. You were thinking, i got to replace this car. There's a knock in the engine. i got to put braces on my kids. i got to do this. i got to do that. There was a lot of things you were thinking. But man, what can I contribute to the kingdom of God? It's not automatic, right? It's not automatic. The second thing, like if you went to college, right, and, and you went to school, when you went to school, you didn't think, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my degree, I'm going to get a high-paying job, and when I do that, I'm going to be able to take a chunk of what I make and just give it away. You weren't thinking that, were you? You were thinking, this is the house I'm going to live in, this is the car I'm going to drive, this is, these are the clothes I'm going to wear, these are the vacations I'm going to go on. And it's almost like generosity sneaks up behind us and taps us on the shoulder and goes, you need to do this. Now, here's the reaction when that happens. We resist it. We resist it when it happens. Some of it for good reasons and some of it for bad reasons. Here's what, here's what I want to, a question that I think all of us need to know is we're trying to process this thing that isn't natural. The big question I need answered, and I think you need answered, is why doesn't God just provide? Why didn't, why didn't God just, like, dump money down on the kingdom, the church? Let me explain what I mean. I have a tendency to be a daydreamer. And I envision, I, I'm confessing this, I don't know if this is good or bad, I daydream about God just dumping a bunch of money in my life. Anybody else do this? Oh, okay, so dishonest people. Um, <laughs> no, you just, you just imagine what it'd be like. My daydreams are kind of elaborate. Um, we... We, when we moved in this building, there were like five different safes in the building, like in the ground and in walls and stuff like this. And I was like, we're going to open one of those safes. <laughs> we're going to be like, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> or or we, in one of those safes, we found a lost and found jewelry box, okay? And there was a jewelry box and there was some old jewelry in there. And I was like, man, we're going to take this to the antique shop and they're going to be like, that's the heart of the sea, you know, or whatever. That's... <laughs> The old lady didn't drop it in the ocean, and um, <laughs> we're, you know, everything's going to be fine. I, I envision people driving up and being, you know, a West Texas millionaire, and he's like, I've heard your church online, and here's a check for $1 billion, you know? I daydream. 
Because God could do any of that, right? God could just material. I could just walk in one day and there'd be a pile of cash laying around. And, and God has provided in, a, in amazing ways in the past. But it's a real question. If, if God's for this, if he's in it, why doesn't he just, why does he just dump it out? Why does he ask all of us to, to do it? And there's an answer to that question. And I believe it's deep and I believe it's biblical. And I believe it's this. Because when we hear about generosity, we have sort of a resistance that happens. It's not all bad. The, the first part of it is a logical progression we go through. Uh, when somebody comes up to a gas station and be like, man, can I get five bucks? I'm trying to go to Toledo. I need gas money, you know? What do you think? I think, no. Yeah, right, you're trying to get to Toledo, you know? I'm, and I hope you don't think less of me, but the logical progression I go through is, no. No, I'm not, I'm not going to give you five bucks. One, because I don't believe you, and two, I don't believe you, right? That's... That's not bad. That's not a bad thing. And some of you are these big bleeding hearts and you're like, well, it's my job to give and we'll just see what happens. And I'm like, Stop it! <laughs> Stop doing that! Anyway, sorry, I digress. <laughs> but there's a logical progression that goes, should I be doing this, right? And so you work through that and some of you, you're like at this church and you're like, yeah, but how much does the pastor get paid? Right? That's a good question, honestly. And just so you know, I'm the highest paid staff member here, and my kids qualify for lunch, uh, reduced lunches. So just so you know, <laughs> these are the same pants I wear every week. <laughs> Has anybody noticed that? Has anybody noticed <laughs> that I only have one pair of pants? Anyway, uh, just make you uh, But that's not a bad thing to ask. I want to know that too. I want to know, are they wasting this? What's, what's going on? Who's getting rich off this deal? But then... I believe there's a much deeper thing that happens, and this is the answer to the question. Because I think once you get past these logical questions that you have, and you dig in deeper, I think if you look in every single person's heart, and this includes mine, in every one of our hearts, there is a depraved creature inside of our heart holding our wealth going, It's mine! <laughs> you can't have it! Honestly, that's us, isn't it? We're holding on, going, no! You can't, no. And that depraved creature is our sinful nature. It's the part that's far from God. It's the part that doesn't trust God. It's the part that doesn't believe that God's going to take care of our needs no matter what. It's the part of us that doesn't believe in God's word. And it's the part of us that values our life as more important than other people's lives. And so God comes and he says, here, I am giving you. I believe everything that God wants us to have, he's already provided us. Except he hasn't just put it in a safe here at the church that we haven't found yet. He's put it in your, then mine, checking account. It's already there. Everything that God wants to do is already here. And he asks us to, to kill that, that sinful nature, that creature that's inside of us. And when we do, here's the, here's the real trick about it. That's when we actually have peace with our finances. I, I can tell you that from a firsthand place. I, that's the, the way you think you're going to have peace is just by holding on to every single dime you can possibly get a hold of. But real peace comes by holding it openly and just saying, God, what do you, what do you want me to do? I want to give you an example of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is one of my, one of my favorite passages in the Bible because it expresses the dichotomy of a group of people who have put their faith in God. And I think this probably, if we look into it, probably describes many of us in here. Second Corinthians 8, 1 through 5 starts like this. He says, and now brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. So just to be clear, he's talking to the Corinthian churches, which is a the church inside of the city of Corinth. But he's bragging about other churches, Macedonian churches. So hey, Metro is a great church here in Down River at the other end of Eureka. This would be like me coming to you and saying, hey, I just want to tell you about the awesome things that Metro's doing, not you. Right? That's, that's what he's doing here. He's bragging on another church and he's lifting it up and he's saying, this is the kind of thing that you, the Corinthian church, ought to do. Now, this next verse describes God in the middle, in the middle of anybody's life. 
I want you to check this out. He says about the Macedonian churches, in the midst of a very severe trial, we don't know what that trial is, but we know the Macedonian churches were in the middle of a severe trial. Their overflowing joy, now just before we even finish the sentence, think about that. Severe trial led to overwhel- overflowing joy? He says next, and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. What? That's backwards. He's got that wrong. Are you talking about the same church? Right? Their severe trial led to joy, and their poverty led to generosity. That's not normal. That's not normal. Right? When you see, when you see areas that are, that are depressed and are struggling, you think to yourself, oh, well, they can't do anything. They're broken. They need people to help them. There's nothing good happening there. I got to tell you, as somebody that's not from Michigan, when I was living in Missouri or I was living in Nebraska and I would hear about Detroit or parts of Michigan, I'd be like, those poor sad people. Right? Honestly, I don't know if it's just because the way the news victimizes everybody or whatever, but it was just like, those poor, poor people. They have to live up there. And when we moved up to Detroit, they were like, God bless you. <laughs> like we're going to Haiti or something. And so we moved up here and surprisingly, y'all are, are doing all right, right? You're, you okay, okay? So that's what the, normally you think. You think, man, you have severe trial. You, your economy is difficult. Maybe, maybe there's a persecution. Maybe whatever it is, this, this, this trial leads to, to sadness, right? And when you, when you have poverty, you just don't have anything to give. You don't have anything to share, right? That's, that's what poverty is. Except when God kills that creature, in our life. Except when, when that part of us that's hanging on to everything we have is crucified by Jesus. And then you have a completely different result. And I want to talk to every single person in here. I don't care what you have or what kind of background you have or what God's given you or what God hasn't given you. You may have gone through a lot of tough stuff. You might have had some hard times. You might have lost out on some investments. You might have, you might have ended up in a bunch of debt. I want to tell you, no matter where you're at, God wants to do something in your life. And it's not about amounts. It's about killing that creature in your life. The next verse goes like this. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and beyond their ability. I'm not sure how you give beyond your ability. I'm not sure how that works. Jesus knows how that works. He produced the bread and the loaves and everything, but I'm not sure how I do that. How do I give beyond my ability? And yet Paul's bragging on them. He's saying this is, not only is this huge, this is beyond huge. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. I've never had that. I've never had somebody come up to me and be like, that was such a great service. Can I write you a check? Right? No, 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 don't write me. Please let me write you a check. Okay, all right, and go ahead and write. You know, that that, that doesn't usually happen, that people plead with you to be able to do that. But that's where this Macedonian church is, because I believe there is the example that Paul's using, man, that, that God has set them free from that creature in their life. There's a lie that we believe in that says, man, I don't have enough, I don't have enough, and God comes to us and says, listen, I just want you to just be obedient to me. Now, here's what's important. Catch this out. The next verse goes like this. And they, and they exceeded our expectation. This is the key to it all. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord. I do not want anybody in here to give to me. I don't want anybody here to make any kind of contribution because they're giving to LifeBridge. I want you first to go, God, do you want me to do this? Do do you want me, do you want me to do this? This isn't about whether the, the church or this or this or that or whatever. Maybe it's not even given to church, given to this church. It's just going, man, I, I want to do what God wants me to do with my money. And if you're looking for a reason, if you're looking for some, some excuses of not to give anywhere, you can find them everywhere you go. Right? There is no good organization to give to. Because <laughs> they're all run by people. Okay? Except for LifeBridge, it's great. Um, <laughs> 
So <laughs> John was like, don't say that. Anyway, no, no, honestly, first of all to the Lord, that's what matters. Give, give the, honor God with your, kill that creature inside of you. And then it says, and then by the will of God also to us. Now he says, and I, I mentioned this verse last week, I want to reiterate it again. He says this, but since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and love, in other words, because you're growing up in all kinds of different ways in your faith and, and, and you're growing and maturing and you're becoming more like Jesus, because you're doing that um, with all kinds of love kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. Excel in the grace of giving. So he's saying, don't, don't, just, don't just grow in your knowledge of the Bible and your understanding of who God is and your relationships and your love and all that kind of stuff, but, but grow in this grace of giving. And again, the reason is because that creature, he doesn't die all at once. You have to starve him out, right? He has to let go of that grip on your heart, and you have to learn to trust God and not in yourselves, to put your faith in him, to put other people before, before uh, yourself and trust in God. I want to show you what we call the, uh, the giving ladder around here because I'm not asking anybody to do what they can't do. I'm, I'm asking people, just consider where you're at and how you can excel in the grace of giving. It's called the giving ladder. It looks like this. We just kind of made some numbers up. We like to make things up. But, but you might find yourself, I hope you find yourself somewhere in here when it comes to your giving. Again, this isn't, this isn't about you being a wealthy person. This is just about what God has already placed in your life. And we don't want to ask you to do something that, that God hasn't put you in a place to do. So you might be the occasional giver. You're that zero to one percent, right? Where you're just like, yeah, I give sometimes when I have something. I, I have that. And maybe you haven't really thought through, man, I need to take a percentage or I need to take a chunk or I need to, to take, just like I'm paying a bill. I need to take a chunk each month and go, this, this is for God. This is for the mission of the church, this is to reach people in my community, this is, this is that. Maybe you're not that. And all that God's asking you to do to excel is just to become that person that gives 2 to 9% of your income on a regular basis. Where you just say, okay. Because you might be like, well, the Bible says to tithe and jump into 10%. Man, that's, I can't. Yeah, that's okay. Just, just grace. It's the New Testament we live in, right? Okay. How, what has God called you to do? Maybe it's just to move to that 2 to, 10, two to 9%. Or maybe you're kind of in that group. Maybe you're already like, yeah, I give up consistently, but in order for me to excel, in order for me to excel in the grace of giving to kill the creature, I think, I think it's time for me to move to, to 10%. And so I want to ask you, if you're in that situation where it's like, yeah, I give a chunk, but, but I haven't ever really said, you know what, I'm going to give 10%. I'm going to give a tithe of what I make. Maybe it's time for you to do that. I want to tell you, there was a long time as a Christian where I was not this. As a Christian, I, I did not move to 10% for a long time. And, and I want to tell you, God still loved me. God didn't set me on fire. God, God, God always provided for me. Uh, uh, you might have heard this in church before. I just want to tell you, it's not true. Some people say, man, if, God, if you don't give 10%, God's not going to take care of you. That's, that's not the way God's grace works. He's going to take care of you. It's okay. It's okay. He's gonna, I was not always there. But I realized at one point in my life, I needed to... How do you grow up, mature, and give 10%? Maybe some of you are, you're Baptist, and you've been given 10%, because you're afraid you're going to go to hell if you didn't give 10%. You know who you are, um, or, or whatever. And you've been given 10% your whole life, and you've kind of been doing it as a, as a law, right? It's been a law. It's like, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. The preacher said, I've got to do this, so I'm, I do this. And you've always kind of found it kind of a safe number that you rest behind, but God's actually kind of egging you on and calling you to do more. I got to tell you, when, like I said, Bethany and I were like, oh, what are we going to do? And, and we realized what we're going to do is we're going to increase. It's not going to be, not going to be a huge number, but we are going to increase, and it's going to take us to that, that place that I've never been before, that place where we're giving more than 10% of our income away uh, in total. And, and God may be calling you to do that, right here and right now. So here's, here's where I want to come back to. It's all about God's grace. In 2 Corinthians 9, it gives us this biblical understanding for what God calls us to do. There is a cause and effect of generosity. Here's what he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. This is not, 
a warning. This is not God laying some guilt trip down. He's saying this is a cause and this is an effect. If you sow sparingly, if you give sparingly, you will reap sparingly. And whoever uh, sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. This is important. This is so important at LifeBridge. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. This is completely optional. For God loves a cheerful giver. So smile when you do it. Just kidding. Um, when, <laughs> this, this is a thing between you and God. I should make that very clear. This is a thing between you and God. And you might take these principles and you might walk out of here and you'd be like, man, those are great principles. I'm going to go do that somewhere. That's great. Maybe God's calling you to do it right here and right, right now. God's asking you to sow at LifeBridge. Whatever it is, whatever you do, sell, excel in the grace of giving. Learn to trust God more. Learn to value others more than yourself. And watch that creature who holds on to your wealth and really is holding on to your heart. Watch him or her die. Let me pray for you. God, I pray today as we as we consider being generous, as we look to the future, as we see what's happening uh, in our community, in our world, and we realize you're the only light and you're the only hope. God, I pray that you would help us to, to let go of what we hold on to so much and that we would just freely and in faith give. And I pray that in Christ's name.